Today, we'll be recounting the dramatic true story of how one man survived a rapidly progressing and life threatening infection, sometimes called flesh eating disease. This story begins on New Year's Eve in Perth, Australia, when 38 year old Stephen bumped his foot that afternoon and sustained a small cut on his second toe. He hardly noticed the injury, and even when he saw that the wound looked a bit infected two days later, he assumed that it would heal by itself. He was young and relatively healthy, although he had felt pretty run down lately by the heavy end of year partying and many late nights. Four days after that initial injury, Stephen went on a fishing trip, and sometime during the afternoon, he slipped on the boat, re injuring the same foot, and he noticed that his cut had reopened. That night, Stephen felt feverish, and he awoke the next day feeling unwell and thinking he had the flu. As his symptoms progressed over the next 24 hours, both he and his wife began to worry. His fever was now raging at over 39 degrees Celsius, and his right lower leg had started to ache and become slightly swollen over the shin. By January 6th, he was having difficulty walking and noticed a few red lines on his thigh in the area of his groin, where he now also had a large swollen tender lymph node. At this point, Stephen realized that he needed medical attention and drove to the local medical center where the physician on duty was concerned by Stephen's fever, his low blood pressure and elevated heart rate, and his red swollen leg. She was also alarmed by Stephen's description of the pain, which seemed disproportionate when compared with the appearance of the skin lesion on his leg. So, suspecting that this could be necrotizing fasciitis, she promptly sent Stephen to the hospital for emergency care, circling the erythematous area on his leg with a black pen before he left so that the progress of his suspected infection could be monitored. By the time Stephen arrived at the hospital, the red area on his leg had spread beyond that black line. Stephen told the ER physician on duty that he felt like he was cooking inside his skin and that the pain was unbearable. He was quickly started on empiric IV antibiotic therapy, as well as IV fluids to treat his hypotension. The ER physician ordered several investigations, including a CBC with differential, serum chemistry studies, and arterial blood gas measurements, as well as blood cultures and a urinalysis. Stephen was also sent for a CT scan to help delineate the extent of the infection, and a surgical consult was ordered for this patient. When the surgical team arrived, they brought scary news for Stephen. His CT scan showed extensive soft tissue inflammation and a thickening of the fascial planes that supported the diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. Stephen would need emergency surgical debridement to try and remove the infected tissues. Because this kind of infection spread so rapidly, it was possible that they would not be able to save his leg. Within hours, Stephen was wheeled into the operating room where surgeons debrided the infected leg, sending tissue samples for culture and gram stain, as well as a PCR assay that would test for the genes coding for a specific exotoxin produced by Group A Streptococcus. The results of these tests confirmed that the microorganism responsible for Stephen's infection was Group A Strep. Group A strep, also known as strep pyogenes, is a gram-positive bacterium that can cause a wide range of diseases in the human host, depending, among other factors, on the tissue it colonizes and on the immune status of the host. In Stephen's case, the group A strep bacteria likely entered through the initial small break in his skin and was able to infect the subcutaneous tissues, replicating there and spreading rapidly along the fascial planes. Group A strep has evolved a number of virulence factors, one of which is an exotoxin that's detected by the host immune system and leads to the production of inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines damage the endothelial lining of blood vessels and promote coagulation, leading to occlusion of the local blood vessels and ischemic damage to surrounding tissues. 
The resulting necrosis of these subcutaneous tissues facilitates the growth and metabolism of other microbes in the affected area, some of which are anaerobic and produce gases like hydrogen and nitrogen. These gases can accumulate in the subcutaneous tissues and can sometimes be felt during physical examination, a finding called crepitus, or they can be seen on imaging studies, like this CT scan of another patient who was also diagnosed with necrotizing fasciitis. Because blood flow to the affected area is severely compromised in this disease, antimicrobial medications can't reach the areas of the body that need them most, and surgical debridement is necessary to remove the infected body tissues. If the disease goes untreated, group A strep exotoxins can be released into the systemic circulation and lead to sepsis, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, multi-system organ failure, and death. The morning after his surgery, Stephen awoke to some encouraging news. The surgeon who had performed the debridement thought it was likely that Stephen's leg could be saved. Over the next few days, pain management was a major issue, and the wound needed to be carefully monitored for any signs that the infection was continuing to extend beyond the boundaries of the debridement. Finally, approximately a week after he had been admitted to hospital, a successful skin graft was performed, and seven days later, Stephen was released from the hospital and allowed to return home. At this time, Stephen wasn't aware of the potentially life-threatening consequences of this kind of infection. Only later, after learning more about this disease, did he realize that rapid recognition and early intervention had played an enormous part in the successful management and the complete recovery he experienced.